Let's continue by going over some more examples of continuous functions and theorems related to them. First, we'll talk about the composition of functions and the continuity of the composition dependent on its constituents. So, uh, again, I'd rather not put all the, um, the assumptions out. I think you can write down the assumptions for yourself. But if I have a function from A to B, and then it lands in R M. So here I have F, G, and suppose, so all of these are domains in some Euclidean space, and suppose that F is continuous at C in A, and suppose that G is continuous at f of c, which is in b. Then, if I take the composition, then that composition, which is a function from a to rm, is also continuous at c. And you may have seen a proof of this um, in analysis one, so I'll leave that one to you as an exercise. What you may have not seen in analysis one is when I take functions into a larger domain, how is the continuity of such functions related to the continuity of the component functions? And this theorem is incredibly important for studying functions of many variables. So a function f, let's say uh, from a to R M is continuous at C, which is in the domain A. And the domain A, just so that we have some things in mind, is a subset of, let's say, R N, just to be totally clear, um, is continuous at C if and only if the component functions pi i composed with f which is, let's just make sure that we understand the domains and codomains of this function, f is defined on a, goes to rm, pi i is a projection from rm to r. So this is a function from a to r, is continuous at c for all i going from 1 to m because they're m projections from rm to r. And we'll actually prove this theorem. The proof is rather simple, but it relies on a couple of important facts. So first, let's prove it in one direction. As with any if and only if proof, we usually prove this in some direction. So let's suppose that f is continuous. When f is continuous, this previous theorem tells us that if we compose with any other continuous function at the appropriate value, we'll end up with a continuous function as well. So because, so by previous theorem, pi i is continuous from the earlier, even before this theorem we had, we proved that the projections are continuous, and f is continuous by assumption, together with this theorem shows that um, pi i f is continuous at c. So that part of the proof is rather simple. In the second part of the proof, we'll only assume that the projection, uh, the function composed with the projections, namely the component functions, are continuous, then f is continuous as well. So for the converse, we will try to do this using an epsilon delta argument. So fix epsilon greater than zero and also and c. c is fixed from the discussion to begin with anyway. Um, so now then we assume that the component functions are continuous then since pi i composed with f is continuous at c there exists a delta, and let's call it delta i, 
because this will depend on the projection functions that we look at. There exists a delta i such that x is in the neighborhood around delta i, around the point c, provided that it's also in the domain a, implies that the projection at x is in the neighborhood epsilon around the image of C. Well, the image of f of x, which is C, which is actually the image of, um, let's write this properly, is um, pi i at C, at f of, at f of C. Sorry about that. So then, so we have m of these delta i's. That's a finite number of delta i's. Usually when you have a finite number of such deltas that you've been able to construct from some other assumptions, it's convenient to take the smallest one such. So let's set delta equal to the minimum, oops, the minimum of all of these deltas. Then you can check that this actually works. Then, and I'll leave that little step for you as an exercise, then x is in the domain f delta c intersect with a implies that f of x is actually in the domain um, around the image of c. And I highly suggest to draw a picture for this. Um, analogous to other pictures that we've drawn about, for instance, in the nested rectangle video. Look at a couple of rectangles and see to make sure that this works. So that's actually the end of the proof. And this gives us several other examples of continuous functions. There's also a similar theorem that tells us that the sum of two continuous functions is continuous, such as, and as also the difference. Um, we also know that if we take the product of two functions that are continuous, provided that their codomain is just the set of real numbers, because I don't know what it means to take the product of vectors, at least I haven't defined one such product yet. And we also know that we can divide by functions, and if the division makes sense, namely if the denominator is never zero at the point, then the, also the, the ratio of those two functions is continuous. But let's look at so that theorem should be familiar. Let's look at other examples of continuous functions that will be um, useful throughout. The norm function from Rn to R is continuous. This is just the function that takes the magnitude of any vector in Rn. And the proof that this is continuous is actually quite nice. Um, and it relies heavily on the continuity uh, of this theorem right here. So let me re-express what the norm function is in terms of more elementary functions. So this function, what we start off with is, we start off with an element in Rn. Think about what the definition is. It takes a, the square of each entry. So we take the square of each entry, and that gives us again another element of Rn. Then we add every single one of those entries. And adding is actually a special case of the function s we had from before, where s, is, s of x comma y is the sum of x and y. Um, in the case of n components, we just iterate that sum multiple times. And by the associativity of addition, it doesn't matter which way I iterate them, as long as in the end I'm adding them all up. So this is, in a sense, the function s. The sum of those numbers is an element in R. And now I have this real number. Actually, not only is it an element of R, it's a non-negative number. So let me indicate that by writing that this is greater than or equal to 0. And then I take the square root of that number. And the square root function is a function from non-negative numbers to the real numbers and it's continuous, as we probably know from the first semester of analysis.
So what do we have here? We have squaring each entry, which is a continuous function. Then we take the sum of all of the entries. That's a continuous function by our previous theorem. And we take the square root, which we know is a continuous function. So by this composition rule, we know that the composition of these functions is continuous. But the composition of these functions is exactly the norm function. So these functions are equal, i.e., this diagram commutes, and by continuity of all of its constituents, we know that this norm function is continuous as well. There are lots of other examples of continuous functions, such as taking the inner product of two elements, and I'll leave that to you as an exercise, and the proof is somewhere along the lines similar to this one.